Good afternoon and thank you for joining us here today. Uh, yesterday we announced the return of mask wearing for all indoor public settings in Perth and Peel to help minimise the spread of the Omicron variant in our community. I want to thank the West Australian community for following the health advice immediately as I saw so many people put on their masks uh, before 6pm last night uh, when the new rule officially took effect. We know the Omicron variant is highly transmissible and mask wearing is confined. Uh, sorry, and mask wearing in confined and enclosed spaces helps limit transmission. So please mask up and keep checking in using Safe WA. Now, we're, now we are reporting three local cases of COVID-19 up until 8 p.m. last night. These are the same three local cases announced yesterday afternoon, linked to the COVID cluster and a known close contact of a previously reported case. One of the three local cases had not been in quarantine for their whole infectious period, which has res resulted in more exposure sites being published online today. As contact tracing continues and more exposure sites are known, they will be added. To 8pm last night, in addition to those three local cases, we are also reporting eight interstate cases and one returned overseas traveller, all in quarantine. The 12 cases in the overnight reporting cycle take the total number of active COVID-19 cases in Western Australia to 106. Of these, 33 are in hotel quarantine, 72 are in self-quarantine and one is in hospital, but not in ICU. There are 70 active cases with the Omicron variant. The Omicron variant continues to be the biggest risk to our community. There are 46 close contacts linked to the Omicron COVID cluster. 35 have tested negative and 11 are to be tested or their, their results are pending. So far, we have 1,152 casual contacts of which 869 are negative and 263 to be tested. In addition to the confirmed positive cases, we are also managing 1,017 people in hotel quarantine and 2,188 people in self-quarantine. The people in self-quarantine are subject to the G2G Now real-time monitoring as well as physical checks when necessary from WA Police. We still have approved travellers flying into Perth under our extreme risk border control settings with 156 people spread across four flights today. As I said yesterday, U Natural Spa in Applecross and New Massage in Mount Lawley are of significant concern. I'd like to thank our contact tracers in Health and WA Police who are working together as they continue to interview and investigate cases from these sites to ensure people are tested and quarantined accordingly. Yesterday, we undertook 3,728 tests across public and private clinics. We did see a slight increase in testing throughout the afternoon and evening after we raised the alarm and called on Western Australians to get tested. But we need, we need to get more tests done. It's as simple as that. We need to get test numbers up to make sure we understand where Omicron is so we can take further action as we need to. We expect there are more cases in the community and we need to track them down. Test results that are returned today and tomorrow will be telling. Please, even if you feel slight symptoms, do not ignore the signs. Get tested today. Check the exposure sites regularly and get tested if you have been there. Ensure you monitor these venues because following detailed interviews and contact tracing, the venues and exposure times are updated. Our public testing clinics will remain open again until 10 p.m. tonight. Visit wa.gov.au for all the exposure site information and more information on testing clinics in WA. Help is also available through 13 COVID, that is 1326843. The latest on the ships off the coast. WA Health and WA Police continue to monitor the two ships with reported cases of COVID-19 through returned positive rapid antigen tests. The British Chief, a chemical oil tanker, remains off the coast of Port Hedland with seven crew who have now returned positive rapid antigen tests. The infected crew members are isolating in their cabins 
and are being safely monitored from afar. We are advised there is no need for the ship to come to shore. The other ship is the MV La Stella, a cargo bulk carrier sailing under the flag of Belgium. It is travelling to Bunbury, where we're advised it can safely load and continue to travel on. Six crew have, been, have returned a positive rapid antigen test result out of the 20 crew members on board. Authorities will continue to use strict COVID protocols to manage these ships. However, again, it shows how Omicron can enter Western Australia, even with the best of plans and protocols to keep it away. That's why we cannot be complacent and we cannot drop our guard when it comes to COVID-19. This is why we need to do everything we can to protect ourselves and the community. You can protect yourself by getting vaccinated, in particular, your third dose. Our vaccinations continue to climb, with Friday being one of the biggest vaccination days for Western Australia. More than, more than 43,000 vaccines were administered on Friday, right across the state through clinics, pharmacies and GPs. 43,000. Over the weekend, we administered a total of 35,153 vaccines. Our first dose rate now sits at 95.3% over 12. Our second dose rate is at 87.9% over 12. Our third doses are now at 21.9% based on the 16 plus rate. It's been a week since we started administering vaccines to five to 11 year olds. We've administered 18,630 doses of the paediatric COVID-19 vaccine for five to 11 year olds. Of those, 8,859 were administered in state-run clinics. Pleasingly, so many Western Australians are doing the right thing and getting themselves vaccinated. So please keep it up, WA. I'll take questions in a moment, but first I wanted to say, for many of us, wearing masks isn't fun. We know it's going to be a hot week, but we know Omicron is potentially out there in the community. We also know that we can protect ourselves and stop the spread by wearing a mask. So please, as uncomfortable as it might be, do the right thing and wear a mask indoors. If you haven't already, book in to get vaccinated, especially for your third dose. I'll now hand over to the Health Minister before taking some questions. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everyone who came forward for testing yesterday. Nearly 4,000 tests were carried out across the state, which is an improvement, but we still need to do better. Uh, we do continue to see cases linked to the spa business in Applecross. So this is clearly a high exposure risk site. And if you visited this site during the time period in question, please come forward and get tested immediately. You can find the exposure sites listed on wa.gov.au and Healthy WA. Uh, these lists are being con continually updated, so check them regularly. Our state-run metropolitan testing clinics will be open until 10 p.m. this evening. And if you are feeling unwell, you should also get tested and isolate. By now, we should all be very familiar with the symptoms of COVID-19. They include fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, runny nose, or a loss of smell and appetite. The severity of the illness can range from mild to severe pneumonia. So while you may not get seriously ill, others in our community may. So it is imperative that anyone who visited the exposure site or is feeling unwell comes forward and gets tested. It's also just as important for the sake of your health and others in our community that you get vaccinated, including getting your third dose as soon as you are eligible. We continue to see record numbers of people getting vaccinated and I'd encourage everyone to keep this up. More than 43,000 doses were administered on Friday and this is a huge achieve achievement and our entire state can be proud of this. Check the Vaccinate WA website to find a clinic and make a booking. Bookings are available at GPs and pharmacies as well as state-run clinics. So thank you all to those as well for using the check-in using Service WA or Safe WA. And yesterday there were nearly 1.5 million check-ins via Safe WA. Service WA now has 394,000 users as of uh, 12 noon yesterday. 
It's a great to see so many West Australians getting behind the new app, and I encourage everyone who has not downloaded it to register, download and register for Service WA now. It is free, convenient and secure, and it will change the way that people connect across services through the state government. It allows you to show your proof of vaccination, check in with Safe WA at businesses and venues, and access a G2G pass for interstate travel in one app. It also helps you access important COVID-19 information. Using Service WA means you won't need to open multiple apps or carry other forms of identification. It can be a bit tricky to set up, but you only need to do it once. There is a step-by-step how-to guides available on wa.gov.au to help with the process. You can also call 13 33 WA if you need assistance. As always, it's important to keep up the public health measures. Follow the health directions. Wear your mask indoors in Perth and Peel or in the regions if you have visited Perth and Peel since the 6th of January. Wash your hands and social distance and check in using Safe WA and Service WA. Our hospitals are continuing to prepare for our safe transition. Uh, you'll probably notice a new marquee has been set up outside Sir Charles Gardner Hospital Emergency Department and similar marquees will be set up in every tertiary public hospital over the coming weeks. The purpose of these marquees is to allow for defined patient pathways to minimise COVID transmission within our emergency departments. These marquees will be used in the event of a surge. Suspected COVID patients will be physically distanced from non-COVID patients, non-COVID symptomatic patients, while awaiting emergency department treatment. The Sir Charles Gardner marquee waiting area will comfortably accommodate 25 patients and will remain in place until it is no longer needed. Patients will be screened at a standalone pop-up nurse meet and greet kiosk, which will be next to the emergency department. This will help to ensure our patients and staff remain as safe as possible during times of COVID surge. I'll now hand back to the Premier for questions. Brian, any questions? What's your reaction to the AMA today? They say you need to get tougher now because we'll have a surge of something like 50 to 60,000 the most important thing people can do today is go and get tested. We need more testing. We need to understand if there's cases out there so we can trace uh, the people uh, that they may have been in contact with so we can get people into quarantine as quickly as possible. So uh, that's the most important thing that can be done. But you've got to remember we put in place mask wearing uh, immediately as quickly as possible uh, and uh, far quicker than any other state has ever done. Uh, to be honest with you. And uh, uh, the other thing about uh, going very hard on all of your public health social measures, for instance, you know, stopping people going out, uh, putting in place restrictions on venues, all those sorts of things. If you do all that too early, then you lose the capacity to step up. And you also get uh, people tiring of the rules and potentially engaging in non-compliance at the point in time you need people to comply in the future. So uh, the measures we put in place are very um, uh, quite strong and based upon health advice, but the most important thing people can do is get tested now. There's lots of exposure sites in and around Margaret River. Why hasn't the mask rule been extended there and is that being considered? The advice I have is that the risk is low uh, in that part of Western Australia, but obviously if we need to, based upon health advice, expand the mask wearing requirements, we will. Are the proof of entry requirements applicable in the southwest before January 31? The pubs down there, the Settlers Tavern, one of the exposure sites, for example? The vaccination proof, in it, proof of entry? Yeah, is that just restricted to Perth and Peel? No, it's Perth and Peel. Is that something that's been reasonable? Well, we're, we're considering everything at all points in time. So, you know, things evolve. Uh, but all I'd say is, um, you know, the measures we have in place for the unvaccinated are the strongest in the country. The mask wearing we put in place before any other state did. You might recall New South Wales had tens of thousands of cases a day and they removed mask wearing. So uh, we've had, what, about eight cases in the community we've put mask wearing in place. But we need to retain the capacity to step up measures over time and we need to make sure that we take the community with us and we don't have people tiring of the rules. So when you really need the rules in place, if you have a lot of cases, 
you have compliance with the rules. The AMA is basing its modelling uh, on Omicron on the South Australian experience, but as Gary said, 50 to 60,000 new cases a day peaking in March, April. Is, does that sound close to what you're, you've seen? Uh, look, I, look I, I, they obviously have a lot of cases over there. We have very few cases. Uh, but in order to stop the spread of the virus, whilst we get vaccination levels up, we're putting in place measures like mask wearing and strict controls on unvaccinated people. So uh, we've actually got pretty strong measures in place. Have you seen modelling though on, on Omicron? I'm sorry, Rihanna, I missed the start of your question. In terms of those numbers that the AMA is, is talking about, we haven't seen any Omicron. Uh, no, I haven't seen measures. I haven't seen information to that effect. But look, Omicron spreads very quickly which is why we put these measures in place very quickly to try and control the spread. You've got to remember we had what, two outbreaks early this year. We managed to eliminate that. We had an outbreak in June of last year. We managed to eliminate that. Every outbreak we've had, we've managed to eliminate over the course of the last two years. Uh, and we've done that because we've been very, very cautious and we put in place very strong measures very quickly. Uh, and the measures we put in place have been based upon the expert health advice, and that's what these measures are based on. When will so WA's Omicron modelling be released and close contact definitions and the like be decided? How much warning will workplaces and hospitals get to deal with that? All, all of the measures we put in place are being refined based upon national experience and based upon national cabinet discussions. You might notice over East they change all the time based upon their experience. So we are watching and learning each and every day about what works and what is appropriate to the West Australian context. So uh, we'll release them uh, in the lead up to February 5, uh, as soon as they're ready. Can you say when? No, I can't give you an exact date. Have you had that, any preliminary Omicron modelling that you've seen as of yet? Uh, no, we've continued to discuss these matters uh, inside government. Is the peak of WA's Omicron wave expected about six weeks after February 5? Uh, I couldn't give you advice on that, um, but uh, the most important thing people uh, need to do right at this point in time is get themselves vaccinated. And if you're unwell or been to an exposure site, get yourself tested. That's the timeline that a lot of doctors seem to be talking about. Is it accurate with the briefing that you're getting? Oh, I'm sorry, which time, timeline? Is the, an Omicron peak in WA six to eight weeks after February 5th? All depends upon what measures you put in place. Right? There's a lot of speculation about this. So other states didn't put in place measures when they should have. So they didn't put in place public health, social measures. They didn't put in place uh, restrictions on the unvaccinated. You might recall we put in place mandates to get people vaccinated. We put in place restrictions on where unvaccinated people can go. We've kept the G2G pass in place. Um, uh, we put in place mask wearing early. Um, it all depends upon what measures you put in place as to how you can restrict the increase in cases. But I don't have exact figures at this point in time uh, about uh, how uh, we would expect case numbers to grow because it all depends upon what public health social measures you put in place and what testing, tracing, isolation and quarantining measures you manage to keep in place and for how long. What about hospitalisation numbers? I might give someone else a question, are Jess. You able, are you able to say though? Because obviously a lot of businesses are wondering, what are those measures going to be? I mean, where's yeah. the point of that? You, well, we already have measures in place. So we have mask wearing now, and we, hold on, we have mask wearing now, uh, and we have a range of measures already in place about unvaccinated people, and a range of measures uh, that will kick in on the 31st of January for the unvaccinated about when and where they can go and at what points in time and so forth. So we already have a range of those measures in place. The other measures around um, close contacts, uh, when you're required to get tested, all those sorts of things will roll out in the lead up to the opening of the borders, but uh, they get refined in the lead up to that point in time. What you've, you, know, you might have noticed over the course of COVID, over the course of the last two years, uh, you can announce something one day and two days later it changes based upon circumstances. So we want to make sure we nail down the rules as best we can in the lead up to that date uh, that are based upon the best of experience and practice over East. In terms of the um, transmission of cases that we've had over the past week um, in, the, in the community. Have you had any kind of advice as to how fleeting some of those events have been? How little it's taken, um, how little interaction it's taken for, for that to transfer? Well, people have worked together. So I understand that some of these um, massage places, people have worked together. So uh, they probably spent time together in, in, the, in the venue. Uh, for some period. I'm, I advise that the initial case uh, 
was at an, at an exposure site, uh, so the length of contact, I don't know how long it was. Uh, perhaps it was touching a surface. We don't actually know that exact detail at this point in time. We're trying to nail that detail down. The police are involved in trying to nail that detail down. They're trying to uh, find out all the close contacts uh, and the people who attended these venues so we can get them tested. All of that is going on as we speak. How many? Okay. No, I was just going to ask, what, what kind of advice are you getting currently from the show and, and, and other people involved in contact tracing as to how possible it might be to sort of um, get on top of the spread of these cases, to sort of know where it all is, think that you might have sort of slowed it down a bit, or is it just not going to be possible? Well, at this point in time, we've had, what, eight, eight cases um, in the course of the last um, week or so. Uh, New South Wales is having 40,000 cases a day. So obviously the measures we're using for contact tracing, the mask wearing and everything else we're doing is having some impact. So, um, but you know, that's the thing about COVID. You can't actually um, know unless you get large numbers of people tested. So we're trying to actually get the information for our purposes and to be transparent for you. And the way to do that is for people who've been to exposure sites or people who've been unwell to please go and get tested. We have these clinics sitting there all day, PCR clinics. So uh, the only state I think that has open PCR clinics to anyone left, all the other states have abandoned that model. So they're there, they're sitting there, there's people there waiting to test people. So if you're unwell, if you've got a runny nose, if you've got a cough, go and get tested. If you've been to an exposure site, go and get tested. That's what they're there for, it's free. Uh, and as I said, the only state still providing that service to the population. Well, can you tell us about what the definition for close contact is likely to look like? We'll work that out in the lead up to the safe opening plan. How many hospital beds are you expecting to be ready and available for COVID February 5, given 25% of hospital patients in New South Wales right now have COVID? So we've had 300 additional beds come online out of a 530 additional bed uh, provision and the rest of the beds will be coming online over the course of this year. That's the equivalent of a major new tertiary hospital being provided in Western Australia uh, to meet the needs of the public, including uh, the COVID needs. In terms of the numbers of beds, it all depends upon the number of people that get the virus and how you manage to keep uh, the spread of the virus down. Now, New South Wales, you remember they had the sort of um, the, the, the laissez-faire approach. They basically said, we're not gonna have any rules, you know, go out there and enjoy yourself. They have massive spread of the virus. So obviously that's not the approach we will adopt. And we expect uh, the measures we will have in place will keep the spread of the virus down. And so therefore uh, you'd expect when you keep the caseload numbers down, you keep the hospitalization numbers down as well. Even in Victoria though, where restrictions have been maintained, there's 1,200 people in hospital with COVID now, given WA hospitals have already been at or close to capacity recently, 300 extra beds isn't going to be enough, is it? As I said, there's 530 additional beds uh, that are being, have been provided or are coming on stream. Um, but you have to manage your hospitals to meet the needs. So at various points in time, as we've done over the last two years, you wind back things like some elective surgery as required. Uh, because that's what the system has done over the course of the last two years. That's what every hospital system around Australia is doing. On face, mask, sorry, on face masks, you said they weren't fun, um, which I think everyone would agree with. Uh, should this Omicron outbreak not be brought under control, are we going to be wearing masks indoors in the long term, like all the way through to winter potentially? I think that's a strong possibility. It's a strong possibility. Mask wearing for the long term is a strong possibility. So. Uh, we can't uh, be definitive, but uh, what we've seen over East is um, when they abandon mask wearing, case numbers go up significantly. What you've seen, I think, is South Australia has put in place pretty strong public health social measures. Admittedly, they have thousands of cases a day, uh, but it seems to have somewhat limited the spread of the virus. So uh, simple things like mask wearing make a difference, and if that's what's required, that's what we'll do. Just on mask wearing, um, the N95 masks, the ones that need to be sort of fit tested for uh, hospital staff suggestions from the um, nursing federation that maybe those should just be reserved for um, people who work in hospitals or people who visit hospitals. Um, is that an appropriate measure, do you think, or should people who are out in the community still be able to have access to them? This is just from, a, I guess, from a perspective of 
not using them all up when our, when our health workers really should be. Some of, some of ours, in terms of PPE, we have plenty of stock of PPE for our hospital staff um, and uh, there's no shortages there. Uh, there's various arguments around the N95 masks. Um, we went through with these over the course of the last two years, all the arguments around them. Some people say that they're required, other people say they're hard to fit and therefore they have, uh, you know, people play with them a lot and therefore it potentially spreads the virus more, more amongst the general population. All these arguments will continue. Uh, my view is uh, mask wearing is good, it's important, it uh, will prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, the masks that are out there appear to me to be pretty good and I just encourage people when required according to the rules to wear them. Um, so Premier, can you just that. confirm whether, whether or not, uh, <coughs> maybe me here, but uh, GDG passes once every five comes around. Would it be an active process that anyone coming into WA, leaving and wanting to come back into WA, would still go through the same GDG process? That's correct. So the G2G pass would continue and that's because it allows us uh, to check people's vaccination status. So people have to, when they come to Western Australia, be vaccinated and you can declare your status on your G2G pass. So uh, it's an important tool uh, to ensure that we continue to have those protections for Western Australians. But you, you don't need to test negative before re-entering? Well that's the problem. The other states have stopped PCR testing. So we announced this a few weeks ago that we weren't going to overly, remember they had lines of 10, 12 hours and mm -hmm. people sitting in cars from all night to try and get tested. Uh, they basically started declaring they weren't going to test anyone to travel interstate and obviously uh, we didn't want to overly burden their systems with people travelling here. Uh, so that's why we'll have to work out and are working out you know, testing regimes for when people get here, predominantly around rat testing. Allowing the Lacella to load and carry on with six crew positive, is that a change in protocol and, and what will be the protocol around ships post February 5? Will they be allowed to dock with um, crew so the advice I have is it can be managed safely at the port of Bunbury. Uh, it has been the case that many ships have come alongside with positive crew members on board. Uh, sometimes they sit there for weeks on end, you might recall. Uh, other times they've loaded and gone on their way. Uh, but as long as all the appropriate protocols are in place, the advice I have is it's very low risk. The the vaccination rate um, in WA is still lagging a lot of other jurisdictions. Uh, the Metropolitan rate, <coughs> so that's about 40% of uh, WA's Indigenous population. Even. Perth and, and Peel, that's still sitting around only 60% um, for, for double vaccination, which is the worst out of all the capital cities um, in the country. Most of them are above 70% or above 80%. Has this been a failure of the state and federal governments, considering how much time there has been um, in terms of having the, the, vaccinate, the vaccines uh, open to Indigenous people that we're just on the cusp of opening up and we only have about 60% double vote, uh, double dose because in the city, um, unlike the country where there might be remote communities, we can uh, sort of put a put an imaginary fence around and stop people going in. We're not going to have that uh, possibility here in the city or places like Armadale, uh, Wanneroo, Rockingham, where there are uh, lower vaccination rates for Indigenous people and there are populations of Indigenous people. Uh, look, we've gone to huge efforts to get Aboriginal people vaccinated, huge efforts. Uh, myself and the Police Commissioner have been all over the state to Aboriginal communities, meeting with Aboriginal leaders, uh, trying to get people vaccinated. We've had advertising campaigns directed towards Aboriginal people and Aboriginal communities. We've had it, um, some of our information interpreted into Aboriginal languages. We've had Facebook campaigns. We've had. Uh, people like Ernie, uh, to the credit of the Commonwealth, they got Ernie Dingo out there leading a campaign around the state. Huge efforts have been gone to, to get Aboriginal people vaccinated. But at the end of the day, people need to go and get it done. And that applies to everyone. So I just uh, say to everyone out there, if you're not vaccinated, go and get vaccinated now. Go and get vaccinated now. You see that we've got cases out there in the community. We're all wearing masks. Uh, the most important thing you can do is get yourself uh, vaccinated, your family vaccinated as quickly as you possibly can. But back to the broader point of vaccination, our first eight r dose rate is 95.3% over 12. Uh, and so obviously the second dose rate will get there. Uh, and our first eight r dose rate over 16 is obviously significantly higher than that. So all the measures we've used have worked. They have worked. Now over the course of the last two years, or last year or so I suppose, uh, there's been huge criticism. Um, 
directed at the state government over vaccines. Uh, we, put in, we did all sorts of super vax weekends and Bunnings campaigns and supermarket campaigns and school campaigns and mandated and every step of the way people were saying it wasn't going to work. Well, it worked. The measures we used have worked. Uh, and we weren't afraid to put in place tough measures like the mandates. Had we not done the mandates, we wouldn't be at this point. And uh, when uh, we reopen, uh, we'd obviously have lots of people who are unvaccinated contract the virus and fill our hospitals, and many of them die. And so the measures we've put in place have worked. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's and I, I do recall, you might recall, last year, uh, when they were giving extra vaccines to New South Wales and Victoria, members of the national um, press and some of the uh, federal Liberal politicians were attacking Western Australia for not having the vaccination rate of New South Wales and Victoria, even though they gave millions of extra doses to New South Wales and Victoria above us. But now our vaccination rate is basically the same as theirs without having had massive outbreaks. So it's a credit to West Australians, it's a credit to the fact that people followed the rules. I think it's a reflection of the fact that mandates have worked. Well, it's their own decision. They made that decision. They didn't have to. Uh, they made their decision. If they want to explain why, it's up to them. On the vaccination rates you were just talking about, granted it's only been a week, but the paediatric vaccination rate in WA is much lower than other states. I think it's about 14 and a half, 15 percent. The ACT is 25 percent. Did we get a per capita share of the paediatric vaccine? Uh, yes, we did, but we don't mandate children. So we don't mandate children, that's probably the difference. And over there, there's widespread uh, spread of uh, COVID-19. But I just say to parents, please take this opportunity to go and get vaccinated. I understand the clinics are very busy. Uh, I'd advise you to make a booking, but you can still roll up without a booking. But uh, you can go to the clinics, you can go to a doctor, you can go to a pharmacist uh, to get vaccinated. There's certain ones that only do, uh, that do paediatric um, cases or children. I just urge people uh, to go and get their children vaccinated. Oh, sorry, Premier, how about you? didn't necessarily think Perth Heston needed to go to that length? That wasn't the advice. Um, the advice wasn't that we have had no advice and they've had no advice that they needed to cancel. That was their decision. So yeah, the person in hospital, <coughs> how are they? Do you have an update on their condition? Clarifying they're not in ICU? The only advice I have is they are not in ICU, but they are unwell. I don't have any further advice on that. I'd expect so. 96% uh, of people have had well, thereabouts have had first dose. Uh, but what you see with the uh, cases in ICUs over east is they're largely, majority, unvaccinated, even though the vac unvaccinated are only about 4% of the population. So I think that points out the benefit of vaccination. Do you have any update on the, uh, the, <coughs> of the 5 million rapid tests expected by the end of January and when that order was placed? Uh, no, we have, uh, we have, uh, we're expecting 8.5 million by the 5th of February. Uh, they're rolling in. Uh, progressively, uh, and then beyond that, there'll be many, many millions more uh, orders were placed last year. When last year? I don't have exact details. The can emergency. you be able to find out for us? Uh, look, look, you know, you can. Look, there is, but this is largely based upon Omicron. Omicron didn't exist until what November or December. You got to remember, before that, it was Delta, and it was all around PCR testing. Uh, the emergency department at Geraldton Hospital could only fill about 12 per cent of its medical roster at different times over December, January. Um, I'll, I'll let, uh, when I finish, I'll let Amber come and answer your question. Okay. She will have more details. Anything more for me? Hey, last, what, sorry, last week, just a topic. So last week when we had that really hot day in the pool, you <coughs> said you were sort of unfamiliar with the cooling situation at Roburn Prison. Are you, are you more, well, are you aware of, more aware of it now? Because you don't have sort of the air conditioning in the cells that get so very quick with night there. So there's fans in every cell, there's air conditioning in the recreation hall, uh, there's various shade structures in the main area of the prison. Uh, for those uh, prisoners with medical conditions, um, there's a number of air conditioned cells for those prisoners with uh, medical conditions. So uh, there's a range of measures to try and manage uh, the heat risk at the prison. Do you think That's it's morally right to continue without having, like how can you justify not having any air conditioning, I suppose, because they're not, they're not oh. rooftop fans, they're not sort of standing fans. Look, uh, there's a range of measures in place to mitigate the heat risk in the prison, uh, and 
uh, certainly those with medical conditions, there's a range of cells uh, to, to sorry, a range of cells that are air conditioned uh, to deal with those people. Uh, anecdotally, I was told a number of houses in Roburn don't have any air conditioning either. Do you still have to vote Look, no, I've answered your question. Do you still yeah. have to vote um, the private climate case? I'm sorry? Climate climate case, do you still have to vote that? Well, I'm scheduled to. Uh, you know, I'm not the one who brought this legal action, it's Mr Palmer. So. He's the one who's brought the legal action. Uh, it's scheduled to start, I think, on the 31st of December or something like that uh, in Sydney. Uh, he's the one who's decided to uh, sue for defamation. Uh, he sues Western Australia all the time, sues people all the time. I'm just one of those people. Um, so uh, that's what's uh, scheduled to happen. So do you have to appear there physically at the New South Wales <coughs> court or can you go online or be there by... The, the advice I have is I have to be there in person. So have you cancelled your... Uh Asia reconnection talk? Yes. And why is that? Well, obviously, what's happening in um, you know, the last couple of months, what's happening in Australia is pretty fraught. Um, obviously, uh, with the emergence of Omicron and a huge number of cases, obviously, travelling overseas is not something I'll be doing at this point in time. How but problematic is it for you to not be in the state that week? Well, it's quite problematic, <laughs> but it's not something within my control, Rihanna. I don't control this. Courts issue orders. Um, and it's Mr Palmer who's decided to bring the legal action. Uh, obviously, I'd prefer this wasn't happening, uh, but uh, he, uh, he regularly brings these legal actions, and I'm another person he's brought legal action against. You might recall he tried to take us for $30 billion, and I passed legislation to stop him, and he took legal action against us. You might recall he brought legal action to bring down the borders that saved hundreds, if not thousands, of West Australian lives, uh, and uh, we had to fight him in the High Court and Federal Court over that. It's just a never-ending story. Thank you. Can, uh, just, can, I, uh, can I just ask you about yep. Geraldton? Um, so they could only fill about 12% of the emergency department staff locally. Um, that's clearly without COVID here. So how are country hospitals going to be prepared when COVID is here? Uh, look, in, in regards to country hospitals and Geraldton in, in particular, uh, we are operating in the context of a global workforce shortage and it is very difficult to attract and retain uh, regional staff despite uh, generous incentives. Uh, but we continue to do that through the, health, through the country health service. Um, we do fill vacant positions in those services with metropolitan based staff. So uh, all of those critical services were provided over Christmas to ensure that we have continuity of service in, that, in, in those communities. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, and the, uh, it was sort of hit with a double whammy, if you like, over Christmas because we had GPs take leave over Christmas and New Year, which meant that we had a lot more people walking through the doors of those regional EDs. Uh, in terms of COVID preparedness, our regional hospitals uh, will be as prepared as uh, metropolitan hospitals. They'll have plans in place and surge plans in place, uh, and we'll continue to work with them to put them in. What do you say to the AMA and the Nurses Federation that both called doomsday press conferences today to suggest that you know the, the sky will fall in on February 5? When you talk to them, obviously you do meet with Mr Olsen and Duncan Smith. What do you say to them when they run those arguments out? Well, I speak to them both regularly, as with other um, you know, significant stakeholders within the system, and I'm always open to listening to their views and working through their issues. Uh, I understand the concerns, and they're feeding back what they're hearing from their members, and that's really important for us to hear. Uh, but we are working towards the 5th of Feb. That is the date, uh, and we are encouraging everyone who can possibly get vaccinated to get vaccinated, and that is the best thing that they can do to support our health workforce. So whipping up unnecessary hysteria and concern and anxiety amongst uh, health professionals in this state? Look, I think they're, they're reporting the concerns of their members and that's their responsibility as leaders in their, in their sector. Are their numbers realistic, a potential 60,000 Omicron cases a day and can the hospital system cope with that given we're at capacity or near capacity in most EVs most days? Well, I haven't seen their modelling, uh, and it's really any modelling around Omicron would be pretty preliminary, given that it's only really been existence in the in the country for for four or five weeks, uh, and you need some time uh, to enable that modelling to be developed. So any any assessment on numbers would be preliminary. Uh, that's coming through. Uh, so, but with regards with any kind of surge capacity, I think it's important to remember that at the moment our hospitals are dealing with uh, general hospital and health issues in the community. 
and the system will recalibrate and will put into place the surge plans. And the surge plans involve also the private hospital capacity. So it's not just the beds available across the public hospitals. If you recall two years ago in 2020, March 2020, we also had in place arrangements with private hospitals to enable um, us to use beds where necessary in there too. So, so does recalibrating mean general day-to-day -day health issues won't be able to be dealt with? Recalibrating means, means non-urgent uh, surgery, for example, wouldn't be booked for a period of time. It's certainly we want to be in a, in a place in our hospitals where we're still dealing with non-COVID urgent issues that will always arise, uh, but it would be non-urgent issues that would need we would need to take staff from there and pull them into where they were required to be, and that is a part and parcel of all hospital surge planning. So do we have any Omicron modelling of our own, or are we still working on the Delta well, we're having those discussions within uh, within government. As I said, uh, any modelling around Omicron at this stage would be preliminary. What about the ANF saying that uh, members are telling them they haven't had any plans communicated to them about how emergency departments are going to be coping with COVID from February 5? Just the lack of communication on the plan. Well, I think as been outlined by the Premier, the situation is evolving rapidly over East and internationally, and it's not helpful for governments to put out uh, draft plans, if you like, or uh, speculation. Uh, what is helpful is certainty from governments and decisions, and that's what we're, we're doing when it comes to dealing with COVID in our hospitals. But we have to understand the situation before we can put in place those plans. Uh, I think, as I've outlined with the emergency departments in the metropolitan area, uh, we will be putting up marquees to start dealing with and practising um, our surge capacity and running staff through those plans. So you'll start to see that over the next couple of weeks. Can you just explain that a bit more, sorry? So a bit people are COVID positive, they should go to the marquee and not into the hospital, or how does that work? No, they'll be met by a, a nurse, meet and greet, which will be next to the emergency department, so not into it, in it, but next to it. They'll do a quick triage to run through any respiratory issues, and then the, those uh, patients will be uh, funneled into the respiratory area versus the non-respiratory area, to try and keep them separate. Will all patients have to undergo that triage, or is it just patients with respiratory symptoms that present Every patient who presents to the emergency department. And we expect such a marquee to be set up at Bunbury, Gerald's and another regional hospital? All tertiary hospitals will uh, have those marquees and we'll be working with WAX around what the regional response is. Now the ANF obviously met with you last week and following that uh, Mr Olsen certainly told me in an email that you'd said that nurses would get rat tests availability from about the 24th, 25th of January. Is that correct, that nurses will be receiving the ability to rack test from that day on? Uh, the, com the meeting that I had with uh, Mr Olsen and the ANF was very helpful uh, and we discussed a range of issues. We did not discuss a specific date around rat tests. What we did talk about was when we would have plans in place around the testing regime and furloughing of staff uh, and that we would be talking to them about that. And is that from next 24th, 25th, when they'll have an idea about how that will work? We well, would hope to ha start having those conversations with the ANF and have a preliminary plan to have a discussion with them, yes. With regard to the current caseloads, um, is there concern that, um, that uh, people who, who went to the two massage parlours in particular are reluctant to come forward due to privacy reasons? And are there also issues around um, just contact tracing capacity, uh, even with the numbers we've got now, in that a Mundaring chemist has been listed as an exposure site, but a Mundaring beauty salon where the owner has tested positive still 24 hours later isn't listed as an exposure site. Can you explain that? Look, I can't explain why things have or haven't gone onto the website. Uh, in terms of your question about contact tracers, there's no, no concern about capacity of contact tracing. We have plenty of capacity and they're very experienced now. Uh, they're quite battle hardened uh, and are very good at getting information out of people, even reluctant people. We also have capacity to search to 300 where necessary, um, and even further across the public sector if we need to go further than that. So there's no, no concern around capacity. Um, in terms of people's reluctance to come forward, I think this is a challenging uh, set of circumstances. Uh, the focus is on encouraging people to come forward and get tested. It's, we're not looking at any kind of punitive action. We just want to encourage people to come forward and get tested. 
that case last week, that was a mystery case for a little while before it was linked to the um, Tasmanian um, returned uh, person. So in connecting it, was that just genomically um, connected or was there actually, uh, was it actually found the sort of place where that might, the exposure might have actually occurred or is there a missing link between the two? I think it was both, but I'd have to confirm that. So there was some fleeting, uh, that both had been at the same exposure site and I think there was some testing as well, but I'd have to confirm that. But they have been loosely connected now. Booster shot had a percentage before, but do you have the exact number of people who have received the booster shot, the actual number of people? The actual number of people, I do not. I have 20.5% over, over 16 um, are the, is the most up to date, uh, but I don't have that in actual numbers, unfortunately. And on that, the booster, um, you're, you're not eligible um, under 18. Is that just in Western Australia? No, is that that's a national decision. And is that a concern to you? Well, we would like to see that. Uh, we would like to see as many people as possible be eligible for vaccination. It has to be done safely, and it has to be done with the advice from the experts nationally. Uh, my understanding is that is under consideration for that uh, 16 to se and 17 year olds. That so that is under discussion with the chief health officers, but we'll await their advice on that. Did, did the government did the government order the rapid antigen tests before or after your appointed health minister? The orders were put in place before I was appointed Health Minister. Uh, so discussions around rats in Australia really only became r very pertinent in around November, and that's when it was occurring at National Cabinet. Uh, the department in November started discussions with suppliers at that time uh, and placed orders in early December. There's apparently no paediatric vaccine appointments available at Claremont and West Perth anymore. GPs are booked out until March. Why is that if we did receive a, a per capita supply? Other states' vac childhood vaccination rates are much higher. Is it a distribution issue? Uh, there's no issues of distribution at this point and there isn't an issue with supply. Uh, I would encourage people to uh, ring around further from home. There are appointments available from GPs and pharmacists for paediatric vaccinations. If we need to, we can stand up more clinics and we can get more supply, but there are appointments available for children. Yeah, I'm happy to, to take that uh, that on board. I mean, I got an appointment pretty quickly. My son was uh, vaccinated this morning and I was managed to do that with fairly short notice. But I do encourage people um, not just to look in their own suburb. They might just have to go a little bit further. Some epidemiologists have suggested WA has already passed its peak immunity due to the sort of waning effects of the vaccine over time and there's a rollout sort of um, been to get to 90% have suggested that's been too slow. Does the government know when we reached sort of or predicted to reach peak immunity? I don't have that information in front of me. So just back on, on the rats, what was the date in December that the order was made? Because it was November 5 when National Cabinet agreed to jointly fund rats. So what was the date in December that WA? I don't have that date in front of me. Thank you. Thank you.